Nashville, Tennessee. It's the three. And here's your host, Laura Harris-Smith. Hi, everybody. I'm Laura Harris-Smith, and welcome to The Three. We are still in Stowe, Vermont, at the Trapp Family Lodge. The Von Trapp Family, you know them from the sound of music. Well, they are still alive and well in the state of Vermont. Many of them are. And I was given the opportunity to sit down with Christina Von Trapp. She is the granddaughter of Georg and Maria Von Trapp. What an amazing story this family has. You only know half of it. Actually, just even a snapshot of it if you have seen the film. They also have this incredible 2,500 acre uh, estate. It is a lodge and you can come and visit. And by the time we're through with this episode, you're going to want to do just that. If you didn't see the last one, please go to the3.tv. We want you to go and watch it. It's a great episode. We were able to show you a lot from the lodge and we're going to do more of that today. So, Without further delay, I'm going to jump right into this interview, uh, more of my interview with Christina Von Trapp. Enjoy. So one of the things that I just want to acknowledge up front is The Sound of Music is not a documentary. <laughs> it's not 100% true. Uh, it, well, it's, it's the skeleton is entirely true. Uh, but then also this lodge is not a Sound of Music theme park. It's not a, an attraction park, you know, so You've a moment ago you heard me referencing my son Jude. He has a t shirt that says, Yes, my name is in a song, and no, you don't have to sing it to me. You know, so <laughs> I love it. It's a, it's a similar type thing, I'm sure. Um, how tell us just a couple of things uh, that are true about the movie. I know the bulk is, but let's just start with your grandfather. He was a baron, he was a captain. Talk to us about him for a moment. Yeah, he was a really highly decorated. He was the high, most highly decorated um, submarine captain. He was in the Boxer Rebellion in China. He started in the Navy when he was very young. Um, so he was really highly decorated and he really wanted to go back and be the captain in a submarine again. And he really didn't believe in what Hitler was doing. Mm. So he said no. Mm. Good for him. <laughs> yeah. All right, and then he, let's see, he died in 1947 just five years, right, after buying it. Yeah. So he never saw the book, the movie, any of those things. Isn't that amazing Just to think the children, about? Just the children, which is what everything is, yeah. you know. Um, okay, secondly, your grandmother really was a nun. She really was a nun, a novice nun. Uh, and she really did make play clothes. No, they really were play clothes made out of drapes. It's up for debate whether she made them. Is that the way that? So <laughs> that sounds like a good way to say. That's it. a good way to say it, uh, because it's such a beloved scene. All right. So, is there anything else that you just want to say? I know that you don't necessarily want to set the record straight, but I am always very interested in, you know, the truth. And so, tell us anything else that you think the viewer would love to know about the real family. Uh, what happened afterwards? Yeah, good question. I think, I think what people don't realize is that our family is very grounded and humble and did all their own work um, <laughs> because there were so many kids. It might be the same in your family. Yes. Like one of them did the cooking, one did the cleaning, one did the laundry, one you know worked in the fields, one did the gardens. Um, you know, they really had their different tasks and they worked really hard at them. They made their own clothes, they made their own shoes. Mm -hmm. um, there's a wonderful photo downstairs of my dad at, at probably five years old, shining shoes with his two older brothers. <laughs> so they did all their own work and that's how I grew up as well. Um, I said I grew up without a TV yeah. and so we didn't know that there's anything different about our family and, and we have our property here and it's very important to us for it to stay clean. Mm -hmm. So my first job and my brother and I, our first jobs were um, picking up trash when we were six and eight years old. And we were psyched because we were making <laughs> money and we had a job. So when my girls were wow. born, they knew when they got to be six and eight, they could start working and picking up trash. And they were really excited about it. Oh. 
And then one time we took them to Boston <laughs> and they got out of the car and they started picking up trash. And I said, no, 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 you can't pick up trash here. And they're like, why not? I was like, oh, that's a good question because it's not our hotel and it's someone else's <laughs> job and there's too much of it. But, but we do just whatever is needed, we all do here. Uh, that's amazing. And we have family business as well. I have entrepreneur for a father. My husband's father is an entrepreneur. So there's this sense of community when your family is all pitching in. Yeah. I was the baby. Uh, in my family, and so my father owned a restaurant, and I'm told that my contribution was at four years old, I would stand on the tables and sing into a wooden spoon and ask for tips. So I don't think I contributed much, <laughs> technically. Okay, so you mentioned how uh, Sam, your brother, now what does he do here? Yep, so he is executive vice president, okay. and he oversees our, our all of our outdoor recreation and farms and forestry. So then, the original lodge, it burnt down in 1980. How, what happened? I, because there's not a whole lot about that as I've tried to research it. That had to be devastating. I mean, look at the rebuild, it's gorgeous, but tell me what happened. Yeah. Um, we don't know what happened. It started down in the boiler room and it was a very cold night. Um, it was winter, it was 35 below zero and, and those temperatures and that um, wood is very dry and something ignited and the whole thing went down. And, you know, like you had said, it was their family home before it became the hotel. Right. So it was really hard for my grandmother hard. to lose a lot of correspondence oh. and um, furniture that my grandfather had made and jewelry and, you know, just, you know, um, photographs and artwork. Uh, that was a loss, it was hard. It had to be so difficult. Werner, now are his children the one that still sing? Yes. So there, so there are still singing Von Trapp. Sorry, yes, yes, there are still singing Von Trapps. Um, um, <laughs> Elizabeth Von Trapp is my cousin that travels and plays guitar and sings professionally. But can she ski? <laughs> oh, I think she can because she I, grew up in Waitsfield. I almost died on a bunny hill one time. I'm, not, I'm so intimidated right now. <laughs> oh, skiing is counterintuitive. That's why you, that's why you need lessons. That's why I had a job. Oh, it's, it's, we say skiing is counterintuitive. That's why I'm here. It is not easy. So when we came in, we saw a sign that said, a little of Austria, a lot of Vermont. I saw a registered trademark after that, so yeah. good for you. Um, but did I read something about dual citizenship? And who has that? with Austria and the United States. Who has that in the family? Austria passed a law a few years ago saying that you can prove that your family fled from oh, war, okay. um, that you, they, they can offer you citizenship. And so I was really excited to be able to do that um, for myself and for, especially for my daughters. Uh -huh. uh, my daughters are you know, coming of age, they could work, they could travel, I and mean, what a great experience for them. And so, so I did my daughters and uh, many of my other cousins did. I mean, it could have been maybe up to, um, I don't know, 15 or 17 of my other cousins. Your father? Because he wasn't born there, so did he opt to do that? That's a good question. My father did not. Um, because of his age, he's, he's now 83, he doesn't see it as something he needs to do. He's still welcome to go back anytime, as we always have been. But really, I saw it as an opportunity for me and my kids being able to go travel more easily. Oh, know. sure. So I was really excited. Wow, so beautiful. All right, um, I have a question actually that my husband wanted me to ask. Yes. Uh, and this is, he would think of this being musical. What songs did the Von Trapp sing? Because we know they did not sing Rodgers and Hammerstein songs. <laughs> so, right. Although those are so catchy These and so are good. so they beautiful. No, that. I love every one of them, but what did they sing? They sang a huge variety okay. of songs. They initially, they started out singing a lot of more church and more somber songs that maybe weren't as well received. So they learned to get in touch with the audience. They okay. would find a local song from wherever, whatever country right. they were that in. that was smart. Yep, and then um, Father Vosner would change it into different part harmonies because they had so many kids. Right. He would modify it for them. They would learn it and they would sing it the next day. And there's a wonderful version of Waltzing Matilda for Australia. <laughs> but um, they sang everything. They sang in all different languages. They sang everything. And their, uh, their Christmas music is some of my favorite as well. That was really my question. And you mentioned um, Monsignor, Father Vosner. Yeah. So he came over with 
them? Did he come from Australia at the same time? I mean, he basically came, I, I read stories about him um, having a family mass every morning and then rehearsal in the afternoon. So how did that work? He left everything and just came. He did. He had to ask his church if he could leave. Okay. And they said yes. They, they all f also felt that he was in danger because he had been writing anti-Hitler articles. Okay. So he was allowed to leave it the family while they were traveling and singing. Okay. And then when they finished singing in 1956, he moved back to Salzburg. Mm. Mm. Yeah. What a story. I, I just thought about how much yeah. hinged on him. Absolutely. And how much he... and. Your grandmother describes how he said, that song that you sang this morning was so beautiful, but, and that everything hinged on that one word, that one uh, but, yeah. uh, because it takes that type person and that type personality to come in and then shape everything. So much more to come. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back after the break. A lady is a lens. Yes, a lens. Game food! I win. What's your name? I'm a bubble. I got one. I want to hold it. Big green, you went to me. Big green, you went to me. You went to go back to me. Then we did it. Back to the three, everybody. I'm Laura, and we are still in Stowe, Vermont, at the Trap Family Lodge. Now, I have been looking forward to this. We are going to go into the dining room, and I am going to have Wiener Schnitzel and Apple Strudel because, of course, you know, girls in white dresses with blue satin sashes have crisp apple strudels and schnitzel with noodles. So we are at the uh, the Trap Family dining room. Here's our lovely hostess for the evening. Can you take us to our table? Yeah, what's the last name? It is Smith. Now we are actually coming in to dine, actually to celebrate our 38th, 38th anniversary. anniversary. So tonight we're having the Wiener Schnitzel. Mm. And they have a gluten-free option here at the dining hall. Um, and then also crisp apple strudel. You have to have that, back. yeah, it's absolutely, from, from the movie. Familiar. Yeah, a little familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Cream colored ponies and crisp apple strudels. <laughs> Doorbells and sleigh bells and schnitzel with noodle. There yeah. we go. Um, <laughs> all right, let's do it, let's yeah. do it. <laughs> that was delicious. The Wiener schnitzel and the apple strudel, of course, I was, giving a little wink there and a nod to my favorite things, the song, uh, the Rodgers and Hammerstein song, Julie Andrews sang in The Sound of Music. So that's what I just had, it was so delicious, but one of the things at the Trap Family Lodge that makes the food so yummy, incredibly fresh, is that it is farm to table. So they actually raise cattle here on the property, and oh my goodness, they grow their own produce, so many of the things that you're eating, just about everything that you're eating is just, it's local, um, even right here from the farm. So from the lodge, from the property here, 2,500 acres. So I am now back in the lodge itself. And you know, you'll see as you go through all four stories, which we're gonna be, we've just been walking and any footage that you've seen has just been from us just roaming the halls. It's like a museum uh, for the Trap family, the Von Trap family. But, uh, but one of the things that I really am eager to do now as we take you through the halls is to just tell you about some of the different things. You'll see the different movie paraphernalia. Obviously there are many movies made about the Von Trapp family. Uh, in different countries even. But also, you will notice they have these meeting rooms. This is the Strauss Room. And you can even go to their website and just check out uh, the different things that they have available if you wanna hold meetings here. It's a wonderful place. Can you tell I'm urging you to come for a visit? 
And now what a treat I have for you here. This is Paul. He was our bellman who helped carry our luggage up to our room. But folks, no, 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 no. This is not Paul the bellman. This is Paul the singer. <laughs> and he's going to sing us a tune. I want you to, to take it away. What do you want to sing for us, okay. Paul? I'm going to sing a part of the Sound of Music. Okay, go yeah. for it. <laughs> do a dear, a female dear, <laughs> Ray. A job of golden sun. Me, a name I call myself for a long, long way to run. So, I need to pull the trade. La, I know to fall asleep. <laughs> Tea, I drink with jam and bread. That will bring us back to do. Do re mi fa so la ti do o do. I wanted so much to join in, but I didn't want to ruin it. That was lovely. Oh, Paul, what what is it like working here, and how long have oh, you been here? It's a, I'm working here, going for the past four and a half years, mm -hmm. and it's a pleasure working here. I get to meet different set of people from different category of okay. lives. Well, I am thankful that out of all the people we could have yes. gotten here that we bumped into <laughs> you yeah. and then bumped into him again later yeah. and he just came and made it all come to life because what's <laughs> the one thing we've not had yet is the music. So, all right, okay. everybody, more after the break. Don't go anywhere. Be right back. All right. <laughs> that was awesome. Neuromatics Oil is a family of therapeutic grade patented oil blends created by nutritionist and author Laura Harris Smith. Invented for her own lifelong journey for neurological health, Quiet Brain now helps those worldwide who suffer from insomnia, migraines, anxiety, seizures, tremors, and more. Quiet Brain contains oils like frankincense, myrrh, lavender, sandalwood, and others. Next, Happy Brain is a bright mood lifting citrus blend and contains oils like lemon, lime, clementine, spearmint, and more. Users say it combats depression and even aids in weight loss. Next is Sharp Brain, Laura's Focus Blend, also used to improve cognitive memory issues with oils like coffee, cinnamon, vanilla, clove, and others. Each $69.95 bottle is a 10-week supply if used daily, or about a dollar a day. And right now, buy two bottles and get the third one free, and get a free eye mask using the promo code on your screen at neuromaticsoil.com or at 1-855-784-3827. That's 1-855-QUIETBRAIN. I'm naturopathic Dr. Laura Harris-Smith, and if you'll give me 10 days, Give It to God and Go to Bed can help you stress less, sleep better, and dream more. There are even links inside to my free 10 Days to Deeper Sleep and Dreams program and 10 Good Night videos. Can you close your eyes and just still listen to me? The whole book takes place in your bedroom and with chapter titles like The Junk Under Your Bed, The Treasures in Your Bedroom, and The Monsters in Your Closet. Give It to God and Go to Bed helps you learn to rest and hear God speak in dreams. Take back your sleep and dreams, my friend, with Give It to God and Go to Bed. Excuse me, would you like to be on my show? I don't think so. I'm Laura Harris-Smith. Welcome back to The Three. We're in Stowe, Vermont. We're at the Trap Family Lodge, the Von Trapps. Uh, and this has been just, gosh, we've had a couple of great episodes filmed here for you. Hope that you'll go back and watch the uh, first one if you didn't catch it at www.thethree.tv. If you didn't see this one in its entirety, you can go there as well. But it's been a great uh, visit here and a sit down with Christina Von Trapp, learning all about the Von Trapp family. These guys are actually part of an industry here and they have agricultural tours. Um, and it's just an amazing, it's like 25 acre, 2,500 acres of heaven. Just a little piece of heaven here in Stowe, Vermont. So I hope, I urge you to go to the website on your screen and book a trip today to Stowe, Vermont. You will not be sorry that you did. All right, everybody, here is more of my interview with actress Kim Carrath, Gretel from The Sound of Music. Okay, tell us now, Kim, how did you get the role for Sound of Music? And really, I mean, do you know how many other Gretels were in the room when you walked up? Was it that kind of an audition? Or did you just meet with Robert Weiss directly or what? Well, I, as we were talking about, I had done several movies before. And so I was a well-known little actress. And so I had a normal, I had the normal audition process. Okay. Um, I do remember there were, I, I don't know, it's easy to look up how many children auditioned for those roles, but it was 
thousands altogether for, for the roles that we wow. played and um, <laughs> all of us. And um, I, uh, I just had a normal audition at 20th Century Fox. And I remember a crowded waiting room and, but it's kind of a blur, you're five, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera. Sure. And I was super, super poised and very mature for, for my age. Cause I was like five <laughs> going on 20, I think yes. at that point, basically. And so apparently, and again, I don't remember this, but I heard it from Robert Wise and Saul Chaplin and whatever. I walked in with my portfolio under my arm, which was presumably <laughs> almost as big as I was and said, good, good afternoon, gentlemen, you know, and that was like the beginning. And you had the, them at hello, interview. probably. <laughs> that's amazing. Early on, yeah, because I think Robert Wise, when he met me, said that that's our Gretel, but I was only five and they really wanted, I was too young. They were hoping for a slightly older actress, which that doesn't happen. No. In general in No, it doesn't. Wow. It happened, it happened then. And so they, um, you know, met a lot of other Gretels and yeah. eventually they came back to me. And Robert Weiss is quoted as saying he would have hired me as his, I was so smart he would have hired me as his secretary <laughs> if he hadn't hired me for the role of Gretel. Well, so he, that the, was like one of his little favorite cute lines that he used to say. I love so, that. Yeah. Oh, it tells us a lot about you as a child, uh, you know, and still sharp as a tack today. But when you see that in a child, uh, because all of my, ch I have six children and all of them were involved in a talent agency. And I asked the, I asked one time the owner, I said, do our children, do you call our children a lot for auditions because they're good or what is it? And she said, I call because I hear from casting agents that your children are easily directable. And when they are easily directable and they're sharp, it saves money on set. <laughs> so he saw something in you that was oh. going to save him money on set. <laughs> Is what it was. Oh, you know, definitely. <laughs> well, so, but, you know, most, the truth is that most successful child actors are quite smart. Otherwise, they couldn't do that. Yeah, you I know? agree. And they're pretty focused because how could they be? I mm -hmm, mean, that mm -hmm. if they were super distractible, it would not be possible to do that. No. So that is part. And, and they're usually extremely articulate. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's kind of, it, it's self-selecting. <laughs> well, here is a question that my granddaughter Eden wants me to ask you, okay? She's 12. I can't believe you have a grand. Sorry, I can't believe you have a granddaughter. <laughs> I do. I have 13 <laughs> grandkids. Can you believe this? But uh, I know, anyway. I know. It's just like, I just can't. <laughs> well, she, she like a baby, so. thinks I'm a rock star because I'm interviewing you. So she, uh, <laughs> yes, she does. And we had to sit down and, and watch the whole movie. And here's what she wanted me to ask you. So she wants to know, what was it like for you on set on The Sound of Music, a day in your life, rehearsal, shooting, learning the British accent? What about schooling, you know, during filming? She just wanted to know what, what it was like for you on the set. What was a day in the life of Kim on the set? Okay, well, I'll have to break that down in pieces. <laughs> okay. So in order to learn our accent, that which was sort of a considered a mid-Atlantic accent, so not exactly an English accent, but mid-Atlantic, right. which is what the studios would teach a lot of their actors anyway. If you notice, if you go back and listen to old movies, you hear the, you know, the actors and actresses speaking in a non-regional yes, way. Yes, yes. That sounds vaguely European, mm -hmm. vaguely, vaguely English, <laughs> vaguely something. Anyway, so they, we all learned with a, they hired a wonderful dialect coach named Pamela DeNova, who just, I, I was spellbound by, by her. She had a chignon and this very exotic makeup and I think a long cigarette holder <laughs> oh with a cigarette. Goodness. I hadn't seen anybody like that when mm. I was five. And she, you know, was, had this lovely accent and she taught us how to speak that way. Wow. And of course, I thought that was blast myself because I was a complete mimic as a little kid. <laughs> so I, I was fascinated and I loved every single second we spent with the mm. dialect coach. Oh. So that was, that's one little section of that. Every day was different. So there's no day in the life of really, for example, if it rained, we wouldn't be shooting. So you could plan a whole day mm -hmm. shooting, but that wouldn't happen. And right. when we were in Salzburg, of course, day in a life was very different 
at the Fox <laughs> lot in LA than it was. That's true. In you can Fox do interior Austria. shots and yeah. Mm-hmm. So for for a day in the life of the studio, it was much more regulated. It didn't matter whether it rained or or anything else. So you would have your hours of shooting, then your hours. I actually did not have to go to school yet because I was ah, five. Okay, but I wanted to be there, so I would go and be with all the other kids in school. Wow! And they just gave me things to do, which <laughs> I learned how to read. In pre- I think already I knew how to read, and I would just read or do things. And then Angela taught me some art, very interesting mm-hmm. art things, because she was always an amazing artist. I it didn't take. <laughs> but I thought it did. You know, I thought I was a wonderful artist at the time. Um, so I just wanted to be in school with everybody, and I did. But I didn't have to be until I turned six. Okay. And then, by then, we had, we were in Salzburg. And in Salzburg, a day in the life was, like, dep- entirely dependent on the weather. Mm. We were supposed to be there for six weeks. We ended up being there for three months. Oh, my. Because of rain. Well, I want to also talk about the Von Trapp Lodge. That's really what these episodes are about, the Von Trapp family and the lodge. So tell me how many times have you been to the lodge, the Von Trapp Lodge, which is in Vermont? How how many times have you been? I've only been once. Okay. And unbelievable to see they I don't know if when you went you saw those amazing black and white pictures which were all over in downstairs of yes. seeing them yes. when they came to the United mm-hmm. States it's unbelievable you know, learning learning how to milk cows yeah and maple trees the cows and the maple and syrup the, kept everything yeah. going <laughs> yeah. Yeah. well so but like learning how to do that fascinating impressive amazing from an, and they're migrants you know, they're immigrants from another country. I mean, this they're was the, the they, entire they, story. They were refugees. They really specifically, were. They, they specifically, really were. Specifically, they were refugees. Mm-hmm. So it was just really an honor to go there. But I would love to go back again. It was an incredible experience. thanking you for the opportunity to come into that box in your living room or your phone, whatever it is you watch the three on. It is a joy to bring you these shows and these opportunities. I think I'm being upstaged by these guys. (laughs) It is cold out here and just starting to snow on the mountain. All right, everybody. I'm Laura Harris-Smith, and we'll see you next time on the three. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.